Um, Jeff, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Dude, thanks, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. I'm so proud of what you built. It's, I, I can only imagine the discipline it took to get here. Love it. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy ride. Um, I think the last time we spoke was in like a hotel room in Oregon. Yeah. I think it, you live you live there, right? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah in Bend. Was it outside Eugene or outside of Bend? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't remember what we were doing. Was it was it during the riots? Was it was it the Portland riots time frame? Something. I think it I think it was tied around th yeah. that because you were traveling that's right. around and kind of doing getting, stuff on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it was. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since then, you've been busy. You've been doing a lot. I mean, it's that's a general expectation we're, from you. We're workaholics, right? We are. Like, you know, it's, yeah. at some point, you just have to accept who you are, warts, warts and all. 100%. Sorry, honey. I'm back at work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Aren't you life retired? Life is work. Yeah, this is retirement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, work is life. Um, when you look when you look at um, your background, well, actually, let's talk about your background first, because not a lot of people have context of your background and where you come from. Retired Lieutenant Colonel, SMU operator, um, very profound military experience, I would say. Um, uh, we were at the unit at the same time together, yep. just in different um, levels. Mm -hmm. I was in a TSC guy in G Squadron, and, and you were a uh, troop commander, and then worked your way up through the ranks. Let's talk about your, your experiences in the military. Yeah, so... I joined when I was 17 years old. I, I you know, I, I, one of these things, you you know this too, because we, we talk about this at the unit. If any of our guys were just a little bit smarter, they'd be in academia or, or in science. If yeah. they were just a little bit fitter, they'd be professional athletes. Like we, you know, we, we've had, we, we've had a couple pros, right? But, yeah. but, but you know, it, what, what really makes that, that unit guy and a, and a soft guy is the all around. Like we're, we're pretty, we're pretty smart. Yeah. We're pretty fit. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're, we're in the, we're in the, uh, we're on that side of the bell curve in all these things, but we're not so far that you specialize in it. So we're like, we're specialists of, of nothing, jacks of all trades. And, yeah. and that's kind of how I was in, in high school, uh, did fine with school. I loved it. I, I ran the whole time, but I wasn't so good that colleges were knocking down my door, that yeah. kind of thing, you know, and, and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I, I already recognized like leadership, like leadership fell on me. I, 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 if I go back as a, as a kid, when I was a little kid, I just remember people like looking to me for guidance, Yeah, you know, or, or looking for me to, to kind of show them the way and, and, and all of that. And even that bled into be, becoming like a protector when I was a, even before I was a teenager, you know, and I remember feeling like, why, why are people looking to me, you know, but then I, I began to switch that into well, I, I don't know, but it's my duty and responsibility. So, you know? so yeah. you know, I was a, in student body leadership and all that in, in high school and really enjoyed that and captains of cross country and track teams and, and, and enjoyed that. So leadership was in my blood, but I didn't know what, what next yeah. after, after high school. And, uh, man, I, I'd like to meet this recruiter. He, he's not gonna remember me, right? Just one of, one of many, but he told me about the military and special forces reserve at the time. Mm -hmm. And of course I knew the green berets, right? John, John Wayne and, and that movie. And I thought, well, this is an adventure and I could, I could dip my toe into it. I could, I could join, mm -hmm. but just be in the reserve. So if I didn't really like it, I could back out of it and all, you know, all that. So I, I graduated from high school in May of 87 and joined the military. I think it was end of June. I was, you know, a couple of weeks of partying and then, uh, you know, getting the haircut off and heading down to Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. And then when I was at Benning is when I, was introduced to the Rangers. I'd never heard of the Rangers. There were there were no movies about the Rangers that, mm -hmm. that we knew about. So when I heard about them, and I'll never forget it, my I was in basic training and the the Rangers wore the OG 107s back then. We had transitioned into the the, the BDUs, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I remember even going through as a as a private, they hand me that camouflage uniform and I'm like, what is this? Because all, all the all the movies are the OG one, you know, the Vietnam movies. I'm like, what what did I sign up for? I don't even recognize these clothes. What's happening? But then but then two dudes walked across the parade field and they had the OG 107s and the Spit wow. Giants and the Black Berets and they're, you know, looking looking sharp. The the, the sharpest damn uniform. I mean the OG 107s were a badass awesome. uniform, but yeah. then st starches and spits on top of it. And I was like, who who are those guys? And then I started hearing these stories about Rangers and uh they said, Hey, this is what you gotta do kick ass in basic, volunteer for airborne. When you get to airborne, kick ass in airborne, volunteer to go to rip, kick ass in rip, and then and then you're a ranger. I was like, well, shit, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it did, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, it was that, that easy, easy on paper, 
So I ended up transitioning and uh, and heading to the Ranger Battalion, and that's where I that's where I grew up, First Ranger Battalion, from from you know eighty seven, eighty eight until uh, ninety two, mm. when I had a, I had a break in service to go to college. Mm. So again, you know, back then, you know, are you going to be a lifer? Are you going to be a lifer? You know, and then you, and you're looking at these old NCOs. I, I laugh at it now because like the 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 first sergeants were like. 32 you know what yeah. i mean like you know I, me- yeah. I remember being in the unit you know i'm in my 40s i'm looking at these young ranger sergeants major i'm like shut up kid you know what i mean it's like you know the, the captain remember the, the old man the captain and it's like oh my gosh like we, you know it's just everything was slightly you know uh, just relative to your own experience yeah you know so i just wasn't sure if it was something i wanted to do for life and, and there wasn't a war going on at that time there wasn't a war panama. We, we had panama and we had desert storms so, yeah. you know we 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 I knew what we were capable of. Yeah. Did you um, do Panama? I did Panama. Yeah. Did you do I, Desert Storm too? I, I did, but it was, we, we did like a show of force mission. So, what, yeah. what, you know, I think B Company and First Platoon and Alpha Company went yeah. and did some stuff. We we jumped in. I don't know if you've ever heard that story. So the, you, the show you of force in jump in, in Kuwait. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and dude, that, we took yeah. more casualties on that show of force mission <laughs> jumping into Kuwait than we did in in, in live combat in, in Panama. So, wow. yeah, I, I was a team leader in Panama. Yeah. Um, did you get and, to jump? I, I jumped in. Yep. Did you get a second mustard stain for uh, Kuwait? No, we didn't. Oh, okay, I think okay. again, you know, yeah. You, you, everyone thinks the military has hard and fast rules. Every, everything's gray. So you know, if you had a mustard stain from Panama, you didn't get one for Kuwait. If you didn't have one for Panama, you did get one from Kuwait. You know really? I mean? Yeah. It was. It was. And they've done the same thing with CIBs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 I yeah. think it was the same thing. You, you already got one. Yeah. You already got one. Yeah. That kind of thing. So. Yeah. Uh, but yes, but 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 I, I write about it. We'll, I mean, we'll talk about my book later. But um. hey, guys, if you know Phil Kraft Survival, if you know Mike Force, if you know me, then you likely know about Montana Knife Company. Montana Knife Company was founded by a buddy of mine, Josh Smith, master bladesmith for thirty years, one of the most experienced knife makers in the country, and he's had no compromise and all the integrity because he's making all of his knives. He's made that decision early on, by the way, to make all of his knives made in the USA, manufactured locally in his home state of Montana. Designed, tested, and built by hunters, Montana Knife Company is a hunting knife company first and foremost. Likely the sharpest knives in the market. I mean, you likely need a bleeding control kit if you're gonna own a Montana knife, and that's a good problem to have. They sell out instantaneously. But for the first time in the history of his company, because he's gotten ahead, he has stock of your favorite knives, including the Blackfoot 2.0, the Spigo, or the Stonewall Skinner. And you could save 10% by using MF10. That's Mike Foxtrot 10, MF10, for 10% off your first order at MontanaKnifeCompany.com. I was a team leader and a sniper in in Panama. Wow. Um, and I kind of laugh at this because because I, I I get sick of this. Everyone was a sniper, right? Have you ever met a Marine who wasn't a sniper? It's like, dude, like not everyone's a sniper. There's like one one sniper per 30, 40, 80, 100 guys, yeah, you know? But, yeah. but I was an actual sniper. Yeah, in, designated in, in, sniper. Designated sniper. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and again, well, re- remind me to talk about that story because it, it's in the book, you know, and, and, what, and what that actually means and kind of what how it shaped my life. Um, and I wanted to go to the unit. I mean, I, 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 you, you didn't say the word Delta Force back then. Yeah, you know? we really didn't start saying it until, really, we became a task force. Yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we invited all these people in to differentiate. Like, oh yeah, yeah. So there's a unit yeah. called. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So it seemed like some of the best dudes that I knew were just disappearing. You know, these 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 Ranger studs, these NCOs, they were they were disappearing. Well, where did they go? Oh, they went to the Hardy Boys. They went to the D Boys. They went behind the fence. And behind I said, the fence. Well, Red roof in. What's Old that? Way. You know what I mean? So it was, uh, that was my next aspiration. Um, so I, I, I extended a year to go to scuba school and then to try selection in the spring. Mm. Um, cause back then, if you had one day left on your contract, you, you could, you could get out. It wasn't, it wasn't like, yeah. it, you know, they, they, they lock you in really early now. Like, so you could, you could play a lot of shenanigans back then. So, um, I, I applied to go to selection and the unit said, no, man, you're, you're, your eyes are unacceptable. I had, I had bad eyes that were only correctable to a certain level. And I tried everything I could. That's a whole nother story. I'll, I'll tell you offline on, on how I tried to cheat the system on that. Yeah. Leverage an old Doc Donovan from uh, yeah. the PA. Yeah. He yeah. Uh, fabricated some records for me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I caught up. Um, so I was, I became that angry young NCO. I yeah. can't have what I want. I'm going to get out. But it didn't take long for me to miss the guys. How long did it take you? 
less than a year. But what oh, but, wow. but what I found was I I, I I found that I was good enough to run in NCAA Division One cross country oh, wow. track. Like you know, I mean, like at the you know what c coming from Wisconsin and the, the cross country and, and track at the universities there was a high level. So I I got out and began running at University of North Carolina Wilmington, mm. and then I ended up transferring out to Montana State. So. I think I filled that that void mm -hmm. of a team and a mission and leadership and dedication and discipline with with collegiate sports sports cross country yeah. and track, and then I aspired for another level going out to Montana State. They had an ROTC program, and it just it just kind of slowly built from there. And then while I was in Montana State, a friend of mine who you'll know I won't I won't name him. We'll talk about him afterwards. His name was Brian in mm -hmm. uh, longest. From my understanding, the longest serv serving NCO in Delta ever. If, mm -hmm. you, if you think I know him, I think you don't have to. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, he 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 called me and said, "Hey, dude, um, they're accepting the uh, eye surgery now in the unit." And I said, "Oh, maybe I'll come back in as an officer." Well, again, it looks good on paper, right? Wow, that's a ten year, that's a ten year journey. A ten year path. The ten year path. From the time you say, yeah. "I want to do that," yeah, exactly. See, exactly. 10 years. So I I uh, I put everything on. I, I was studying psychology. Uh, I came right back in, went to Second Ranger Battalion as a as a lieutenant into a captain, which is very rare, by the way. It it is. It's, yeah. In fact, it's nearly unheard of, for the exception of guys who served in battalion, who had combat, who were respected, and then they they bypassed the yes. ability to have to do their second uh, uh, lieutenant time somewhere else. Yeah. Right? So it it's it's an honor, but there's also a, a practicalness to it, right? Like we, we we don't take second. But lieutenants because they, they need to make their mistakes go make your mistakes somewhere yeah. else by yeah. the time you get to the rangers you've, you've made them so like they yeah so people look at me and say okay this guy already made his mistakes we we know this guy pretty well he made a yeah. shitload of mistakes yeah. <laughs> from yeah. from e1 to e5 he surely are, is not going to repeat those <laughs> as a lieutenant um and then then from from ranger and i ended up going into uh, special forces that was that was something that was always in the back of my mind i i like the small unit stuff yeah i, never, yeah. I never wanted to be the you know are those my men? No, sir. Those are your men. You know the, the yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Standing in front of formation, um, and then and that was one of the ways to get qualified to, to go to the unit is you you ha you get branch qualified running 18th, a company yeah. in infantry or running a an ODA. That's right. Yeah. In uh, in, in SF. And uh, how long were you a second lieutenant in Ranger Battalion before you went SF? A couple years, ninety seven to. 2000 so you go to captain's career course yeah so when, when i left when i when i left uh, rangers and went to the captain's career course that's when i moved off into sf so you already had you showed up to ranger time with the cib a mustard stand yeah airborne wings scuba bubble scuba bubble. yeah yeah and they're yeah. like oh okay <laughs> this guy yeah yeah he's it, good yeah and then and then again collegiate running right like that yeah. was the other thing too uh, you know, I could run under 10 minutes for the two mile, you know, it was, you know, it was like, it was, I, I, I was, you, you just, you, and it's one of the things I want to talk to these guys about this weekend yeah. is like, man, the more physically fit you are, the more opportunities open up. Yeah. So even when I, even way back in 1988, when I, when I got a chance to go to ranger school, the, the dude that was supposed to go to ranger school, he went on leave before ranger school. He was on his way home and he, his car overheated and he, he opened the, the, uh, Oh, what do you call a thing in the front? The radiator. radiator. They yeah. don't have those anymore, do they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he opened the radiator and he burned his hands. So ranger school was like starting a week later. So they said, give me the privates. The, the top the top PT score is going to go to ranger school. So you get so, it out of the way so fast. So I, I got to the front of the line very, very quickly. Yeah. And it, like I can't tell you how many times physical fitness yeah. and that preparation open doors for oh, me, yeah. you know? And, and it was the same as an officer. Like it, I, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, you'd have those banner days, you know, and there would be a, a 5K race and a 10K race and a ruck run. And I'd run all of them and win all of them because yeah. I, I had five years of collegiate yeah. running behind me, yeah. you know? And and to separate yourself with that's that how ability. You're yeah, yeah. yeah, oh dude, that's. Which is a good metric at, at a minimum yeah. for a baseline standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just, man, I get, uh, I, I just, the memories, it, it, it was hard, don't get me wrong. But when people will ask you, you know, do you miss it? Would you go back? Well, of course, but I'm not that guy anymore. Yeah, I mean, you're a different what, human being. A, a troop commander in 2008 doing operations in Iraq and Afghanistan? Oh yeah. my God, I would do that in a heartbeat. Yeah. But even with this body, yeah. but those conditions don't exist anymore. They don't. We can't want what well, we Well, that have. period of time in war yeah. will never exist oh again. Oh my gosh, dude. Because that was the... That was the pinnacle of 
a fight fighting. And I don't, I don't think people still get it. I don't think people understood what we did and what we went through for those years. You yeah. know, those and, narrow oh, set of years, dude. We, I mean, we lived the life of you only see it in movies. I mean, I know, people man. wouldn't believe it. I know. You know, and uh, what's happening in Israel right now? There, this it, 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 it ebbed and flowed, right? Like everyone was disgusted with uh, Hamas on taking hostages and and hiding things in tunnels and and having stuff under mosques and moving people in ambulances and hospitals and and I was like that was every day where have you guys been <laughs> like that was we dealt with that in every Iraq day. and Afghanistan for yeah. tw for yeah. 20 years and nobody cared yeah you know I I write about it a little bit in my book where I was like hey how come no one's talking about this cowardism yeah of of the Taliban and and Isis and al-qaeda and their and their violence how come everyone's poking fingers at every single mistake that a young army or marine guy makes yeah everyone can talk about the mistakes that a very handful of people made over 20 years of war yeah but can any american highlight the rape and the abuse and the decapitation and just the violence that our enemies for 20 years for 20 years so so you yeah. you you go through um so you become an 18 alpha on an ODA. Mm -hmm. How soon after that did you take the long walk? So I think um, I got there in 2002, fall of 2002, and we started we started deploying to Iraq right away. So 10th group had a, a a relationship with the Kurds all the way back That's from right. yeah. uh, Desert uh, Desert Storm. I think yeah. it was called Provide Comfort. Yep. So 10th group was already going in and out of Kurdistan to start to set the conditions for the Northern Front. So we had people, I, I wasn't on the ground, I wasn't in 10th group more than a couple of weeks when we when we started prepping for uh, the invasion of Iraq in, in, in March of 2003. So I got there in, in uh, fall of 2002, I believe. Um, and then we actually infilled into Kurdistan a couple months or a month prior to to the invasion to set everything up. And then I was, I was basically on a rotation of just uh, Iraq and home, Iraq and home. Um, 10th group there, Fort Carson, I didn't ski once. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, you know, it was just, it was, it was just constant deployments. Um, you were one of the first ODAs in 10th group that came from the North. We did. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was with second, second battalion and, mm -hmm. and second and third kind of came together and then split. Uh, and then I, yeah. So I, it, and the ODA I was on was very, very similar to a, a troop. Like I, it was, again, I'm just speaking the facts. Like we were the, the top ODA in 10th group. Yeah. Uh, Scuba team. Uh, it was it was a mountain team, mountain team. Mountain okay. team. So same thing. When I go to tenth group, I, you know, I was I, I could have gone to a scuba team, but who who wants to dive at six thousand feet? You know, what I mean? know it's right? like you know, was, I, mean, I want a mountain team. Like that's yeah. that's where we're at, and it and it was very very similar, the the mindset and the capability of of a troop, and you know, three or four guys from the ODA was on ended up coming to the unit. Um, Good dudes. So then. Good it was guys. it was it was great. Uh, this guy, he was I think he was before your time also, Tr Trevor. He ended up getting killed in that uh, catastrophic uh, vehicle explosion out west. I think it was in 2004. Oh, yeah, yeah, 2004 yeah. or five. I know exactly where, what you're talking about. Uh, Vitek and all those guys. Yeah. So he was he was on my ODA. Wow. And then when I went to his funeral, I saw the other side of the unit on how they took care of him and took care of his family and, right. and honored him. Yeah. So I had, there was already a giant place in my heart <laughs> to go there. Yeah. But then when I also saw that, I was like, okay. The, uh, Cause I also knew they're gonna take care of my family. Yeah. You know, like, it's very different than use of fic or big commands. Yeah. They don't, I mean, it's, it's a check the block process and yeah. then they move on. Yeah. 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 So I think that was, that was pretty much the route. And then you went to selection in, oh, Five. Yeah. Yes. In 05. Fall fall of 05. And that happened faster than I thought. Yeah. Like you 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 pass election and in a couple months, like you're you you're know, there. you're you're there. I was like, yeah. oh, this is this is pretty cool. And you're a major or you're about to prom promote at least. I can't remember. I I don't I can't remember if I was a captain or major yeah. at, at the time. You're 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 yeah, Promotable. you're you're right in that in that yeah. space. Um and then I I broke uh my leg in OTC doing mm. doing jujitsu. Oh. Uh gunny Gunny, oh yeah, no gunny. He yeah. he snapped my He's leg. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. Too. He snapped my leg doing jujitsu. So I, yeah, it was actually quite cool because it's such an overload of your senses. I mean, the the the, the operator training course, like it. 
so, so I, much. I made it, I don't remember how far I made it. Um, and then I broke my leg and then I, I had a recock, you know, so I went down range and worked out of the jock and a couple things. Yeah. Um, so then the second time I was going through that next OTC, it was a lot more oh, yeah. of like, okay, I, I, yeah. I, I see what we're doing. You're here. in the building. Yeah. And you could see it coming. Yeah. You get all the G2. Yeah. So I, I don't wish it on people, yeah. but you also, you also meet a whole new class of guys. So, you know what I mean? You, you have that one OTC class and then a second OTC class. And yeah. you just, Eric Geyer broke my ribs in OTC and I had the option of recycling. And then looking back, I should have done recycling. Cause I was like, when he broke my ribs, I'm like, I can't breathe <laughs> and I can't, I can't even wear body armor and Lord, it would be nice to recycle right now because I'm in this. This sucks. He so you you must have went after me. Yeah, oh seven. Okay, because yeah. so, Eric was in mine. Yeah, oh, and they he, said, yeah. yeah, come back, come back in a little while. Yeah, I love Eric. <laughs> he's you know, a, yeah. he is a good. He's a good dude. Man, he is a good man. Good human we'll, being. We'll share some funny stories yeah, about him. I got again. some good ones on Eric. <laughs> I wish we could record all these stories, <laughs> yeah. but it's just it's just too. Yeah. So how many trips did you get with the unit before you moved on? Because oh, I know totally an officer's right. experience is a little bit different. Yeah. And, and you know, like, uh, it's it's more limited as yeah. far as exposure because you promote and you're going to move up the chain. Yeah, I I, I didn't really. So I, I, I kind of had a, a, a really unique... Uh, oh, yours is very different because you're prior enlisted. Yeah, but but even yeah. even the and, tro even the troop time, you know, and I, and I never... I wasn't aspiring to be like a general and all that kind of stuff. Like yeah. with my five years time, like I, you know, I, I thought I'd do, I, I'd do it as long as I wanted to. I wanted to stay in the small unit stuff. So um, I think I had three years as a troop commander. So I, I did a, I did oh, wow. a, a, a couple years with a squadron, um, excuse me. And then, and then when I was supposed to go to the unit level, uh, something happened to a officer in, in B squadron and I got pulled back to be a, a troop squadron. So you got another was, rotation. So I got another rotation. Wow. Uh, and that was an Afghan rotation that was amazing. Was that VI? It was, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, I wish it well, The dream the, job. Oh, that, that was, you know, oh gosh, amazing. Um, so then, so from from there, I worked unit, I went up to the unit operations side and then I, then I kind of had this weird position where I was on the, what do we call it? The combat advisors group, combat, it was, um, General Cleveland at USASOC. Yeah. The SIG, the Combat uh, uh, Commander's Initiative Group, the SIG. That's right. So I, yeah. I was the I was the CT guy. I was the Delta guy in his SIG. So I, I had this weird position where I was working unit stuff, G Squadron stuff, and then working for General Cleveland. Nice. So I never I never really left the building. Mm. You know what I mean? Was that 2010, 11 time frame? Yes. I remember when Cleveland came in. Or maybe even after. Because the, the, the time I definitely left the building was 2011 when I went to the War College. So I went to the, you know, we, 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 Naval War College. Got it. And then I came back. Yes. And then um, through that opportunity, so it's right around 12, 13, was I was thinking about retirement. My wife had gone through some health issues. Um, my boys were at that age where I'm, I'm starting to do the math, right? It's like, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're talking to the commanders like, Jeff, if you do this, then we're going to need this. And then you, and then you do this and we're going to need this. And it was yeah. like, oh man, I'm not, I'm not going to see my kids till they're 18 or 19. Yeah. So, I said, I asked my wife, hey, what what would you be interested in? Where would you want to go if, if if the sky was the limit? She said, Israel. Well, there's only one job that I know of in Israel, and that's the 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 solo, the special operations liaison officer. Mm -hmm. That's a three year gig. It was just filled. Well, I found this job that was <laughs> We'll talk about this offline. I can't. I can't talk to him. I, I can't. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. It's like we, <laughs> we yeah, yeah. invented this job. <laughs> we jumped this job. So we'll talk about this offline because it, 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 it's it's if they wouldn't have shit canned it, it would be so applicable. Like ten years down the road now of what's happening in oh, Gaza. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll talk about what those details were. So um, in the Bush administration with Condoleezza Rice they wrote uh, an exord for this CT position mm. under the United States Security, Security Coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and it had never been filled. Mm. So I don't remember how I found it, but I looked at this thing and I, I make a couple phone calls. I was like, Is this, does this job still exist? And they're like, yeah, we think so. Like no, oh, one's, wow. no one's ever filled it, you know? Wow. So I called forward and they're like, yeah, it's open. And uh, I, I said, can I, can I bring my family? And they're like, well, no one ever does, but if you if you want to, because it was 
it was a position, you know how we have all these different like covery type things, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was under Department of State. So you were officially under Department of State, mm. which means I had this kick-ass uh, apartment. Oh yeah. I had a, 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 dip, a diplomatic vehicle. So I had a three bedroom apartment that single guys are getting. Yeah. So I said, hey, if, 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 I can, if I have approval to bring my family, I'll take it. So we moved to Israel. Wow. And me and my wife and my two boys and our dog, we lived in Jerusalem for close to two years. Wow. And I was working this singleton CT XORD piece that we'll talk about offline. It was, it was, a, it was a, my dream job. Cause we, again, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel. I, of course a squadron would be an awesome squadron yeah. command, but yeah, man, I was, I was out there as a singleton. Wow. Just doing, just doing my thing. That's awesome. Um, and then came back and worked a little bit with G squadron as I was moving out. So the last, the last thing I had, <clears throat> excuse me, in the unit, was starting to put together, um, they call it the apex program now, the 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 piece uh, to help guys transition out. Yeah, um, which is uh, very successful from what I hear. Yes, so I'm very very proud of that. I had I was a a, a plank holder in getting that wow. going. Wow. Um, because it it was this understanding and recognition of, hey, we we bring in the best people we can find, and then we're just like, see you, good luck. Yeah, you know, and. I think being a psychology major and, and, and watching some of our mates, I was able to kind of predict, hey, this is going to be hard for guys. Mm. Like all of this war that you and I are talking about, yeah, it's going to catch up. Yeah. You know, and, and all of the self-medicating and, and kind of the, the separating that guys were doing in, you know, mentally from all this, it, it it's going to catch up. So we, we need to have something built for them and mm. we need to have a safety net. Um, and what what have we built? And that and that was one of the driving factors to to start working in counter trafficking, mm. where it's like, hey, our guys know how to hunt, they know how to build teams, they're courageous. Uh, it doesn't need to be so based on their physical capability. We, I, we need to leverage their mindset. So what what can I build that's meaningful and has purpose, that's focused here domestically? Mm. And God laid on my heart to look at sex trafficking. Mm. Um, so the intent was always to build a place for, for our people. Um, and it's been eight years that I've been building this now, and we're, we're just starting to get there now. So I, th I think in the next few years, Skull Games and the counter-trafficking effort that we're, that we're doing will be a very known off-ramp mm. for guys. And it's, it's more for enablers. Like it's a, like right now we have, it's mostly Intel. Like how many operators do you, you know, we're not kicking down doors, right? Yeah. You know, so we, we need that operator mindset, but we need these other, these other skills, the things that, the things that you used to do, mm -hmm. you know, some of these Intel folks, a bunch of the, the women that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's becoming more and more a place that soft folks and military folks and veterans can come to find a new passion and purpose, mm -hmm. heal themselves and still bring some whoop ass yeah, on some bad dudes. that's desperately needed. I assume. <laughs> yeah, this mission set is desperately needed because, from the conversation I had with you and and subsequently after that, looking into it, nobody pays attention to this. Like it's not something that it's on people's radar. It's not on institutions' radar. It, it's not a, an active or proactive enforcement as part of law enforcement. It's kind of like a subsequent afterthought. Yeah, it, what what America looks at is overseas. A, a lot of the money that goes into counter trafficking is through uh, D Department of State going overseas. Like if if you looked at the budget, very very little is coming to the United States. Mm. And like you already said, you said a key word there is, is proactive. This is one of those crimes that you got to nip in the bud mm. because by the time these these women and children are exploited and molested and abused and raped. Man, it's hard to put that human back together again. Yeah, and law enforcement, by definition, they enforce laws. Mm -hmm. Proactive policing is kind of a new idea. Yeah, it it, it really came it, it really came to light after nine eleven, right? Proactive CT policing, you know, working counter drug, working counter organized crime. So there is there is models that we can follow, but it's 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 a difficult one, mm -hmm. and we didn't help ourselves with all of the pointing fingers and downplaying the importance of law enforcement and actually villainizing law enforcement. Yeah. So this this idea of defunding the police is a real thing. I don't I don't know if people understand that. Like there there are many places across the country that we defunded police. Yeah. And if we if it wasn't financially we 
depleted them emotionally and psychologically and spiritually and motivating wise. Mm -hmm. We like how many times can you be told you're the bad guy? Yeah. And you're and you're you're every day you're waking up and stepping in stepping into this filth on on my behalf to protect mm -hmm. me and my family. So it, it 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 has gotten worse since I saw you last. And I'm really hoping that we're able to start to move move the needle on this thing. Well, real quick, just in the middle of this, um, before we get into the book, what's the mission statement of Skull Games? Um, and then how can people kind of pull in to help? Yep. We're a direct support element to law enforcement. We focus on open source intelligence. So this, this crime lives in the physical world, mm -hmm. which there isn't a place for a civilian citizen in the in the physical world, right? Like doing surveillance. I think this is one of the things that has gotten a bunch of the trafficking or counter trafficking organizations a bad name. Mm -hmm. Like, look, dude, you're not you're not following traffickers around and, and yeah. developing their pattern of life. That that is very difficult to move into a court of law. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're doing all of that in the virtual space. So just just like we followed and tracked and understood ISIS and Al Qaeda, and towards the end of the time before we got out, we also started to understand open source intelligence. Mm. We had all these systems to follow and track them and they they jumped off of secure comms and they went to the open internet mm. because it was a, it was like hiding in 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 plain space, mm. you know, in plain sight. So these traffickers do the same thing. The amount of information that can be pulled off of the open source internet is is enough to just break this crime apart. Law enforcement doesn't understand OSINT. Um they don't have the time for it. Yeah, there's so, no te technical yep, competency built exactly. into law enforcement for that. So we are a force multiplier where where we can hunt anywhere in the world. We're, we specifically focus on the United States right now. So wherever there is an online commercial sex economy mm. where women and children are being exploited, we can see it, we can map it, we can identify. So the, the three things we talk about is we identify victims that are being trafficked as well as their predators. We interdict this crime by, through, and with law enforcement. And then we empower survivors and and law enforcement to, to be better. Um, okay. And a kind of a small sliver of what you guys do here. So that empowerment too is teaching these survivors of abuse how to protect themselves, how to defend themselves, how to shoot, how to do jujitsu, you know, kind of re remapping these neural pathways that have been broken down to them for, for so long. So just like you're doing something with an intentionality, I think martial arts, jujitsu, hardship, shooting, it's not the skill, that skill has its own value, but it's really that intentionality of helping somebody mm. rewire the way they view themselves and the way they, they view the world. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we, we just supported a sting. So sometimes, a lot of times we're doing it virtually. So we will identify the girls that are being sold online, who they are, so you, so you know their story. Mm. You, know, you know who they are, you know what they need mm. and what the trafficker is using to, to, to manipulate them. And then who their abuser is, who the trafficker is. We push all that to law enforcement. They do the operation, and then we're on standby to support if things are, you know, continuing to, to um, expand from that. Maybe someone else comes in, or maybe it's a John sting where Johns come in and they're trying to figure out who's doing what. Um, and then we also work in the counter pedophile space where we support law enforcement that have these false uh, personas online. Um, if you if you created a persona on TikTok right now that you were a 13 year old girl. Before this, before this uh, podcast is over, you'd have dudes reaching out, sending you dick pics, wanting to meet to have sex. Isn't that you know, crazy? it's just, it's just bananas. Mm. So, because it happens so fast, and it's there's so many men will respond. What we support law enforcement with is who is this guy? Because mm. he's going to have you know Jackhammer Seven. Hey, hey, sweetie, you know what I mean? All these discussions. So now we, we try to help them. Who is Jackhammer Seven? Mm. You know, is he a, is he a previous sex offender? Because if 200 people are reaching out to you, mm -hmm. who do we actually want to engage with? Yeah. So if he's a previous sex offender, if he's a felon, if he's in a position of leadership, like, he's hey, a teacher. he's a, exactly. Ooh. So we're helping law enforcement become much more efficient in getting these these men that have a predilection to have sex with children, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, the the underground sex economy. And you hand over a packet. We hand, basically facilitate. We hand over a packet and then we we sit at our computers and they just they just send us RFIs, requests for information. And you're you're five oh one C three that operates based on crowd source funding yep. that is providing uh this service to law enforcement. Yep. It's it's all five oh one C three. We're we're opening up a gear shop here soon. We've got a couple classes. I have a leadership class that you can purchase online. We have a protect your family class that you can purchase online. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a couple of little fundraising type things, but by and large, 
it, it, we're just a 501c3 that takes donations. And, and, and I want to keep it that way. I don't want to pursue grants. I don't want to get into that space. It's like, look, men and women out there that have created wealth, that is not something I did. I, I created experience. Mm -hmm. and, and and that created networks. Same with you. It's what we it's what we started with. Mm -hmm. You didn't create wealth mm -hmm. in your in your military career. I was broke. You you might I'll you might be starting to create wealth now with Fieldcrest Survival. Yeah. But again, yeah. that's not your your core capacity is what you learned, the men and women that you worked with. And and that's and that's what I have. I have got the most incredible intelligence analysts and enablers just standing by to focus on this problem. We have relationships with law enforcement all over the country. Mm. We just simply need that funding. So if, if if you're a person that has created wealth, I believe God creates us all for different things. Mm. And for, for us to come together from that individual person or even the, the, the corporate side of it, mm. there's a lot of corporations that are looking for where their social responsibility is. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to, 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 to make those partnerships. Let us be the tippy end of the spear doing the operations. Mm. And I will let you know exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it, where we're doing it, when we're doing it, and and uh, and let you touch the magic. Yeah, that's you know? that's amazing, man. What, what, how, where can people go to actually find out more about that? And so skullgames.io mm -hmm. is our is our website. So it's it's .io. Again, that's that's not by mistake. You know, we we te we harness technology. So IO is one of those uh, I don't even know what you call that thing. Uh, the, not the .com, but the IO is it's it's this entrepreneurial startup. So a lot of startups begin with an IO because they're iterative. Yeah. A lot of IO is is uh, computer technology. Yep. So that's kind of our mindset. We're a nonprofit, but we but we work like an entrepreneurial startup that leverages technology, and we are, you know, we're at the twenty yard line, still still moving down. Like what we've been able to build is just the the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. This thing can scale across the US and even even across the world. Yeah. If we get the right people behind it. Yeah, I hope people are listening to this. I'll put the link down below for you guys to be able to uh, donate but also spread the word. The more the merrier on this. Let's talk about your book Where Have All the Heroes Gone. Um it's a pilgrimage through the Bible, the battlefield and back home again. It's a thick book, Jeff. It's that's a lot. It is, but but look at the look at look how big the font is and all this Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's 90,000 words. So th yeah. this was one of those things um, when I'm writing it, I kept doing the little Google and how many pages is X number of words? How many pages? You know what I mean? Yeah. And this thing was supposed to be like 250 pages, mm. but once it got formatted, like when, they, when they sent it to me, yeah. I, I myself was like, holy cow, <laughs> what, what is this? But, but it, it, there's a, there's a lot. And, oh, okay. and, and, yeah. and, and actually it's, it's one of these happy accidents because you you feel like you're getting your money's worth, yeah. But then you, but then it's also a very quick read. Like my, my both my boys read it. Mm. My boys aren't big readers, yeah. And of course, when they look at the book, it's like, oh, that's imposing. But then they're pleasantly surprised on how it's a quick read, yeah. And it's it's I think it's 27 chapters, and each chapter is a standalone. They're all tied together, but it's designed for you to read this with your morning coffee. Yeah, you know, maybe the 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 dump you take after your morning coffee. Like, yeah. you know, like, like it, it's designed for you to read, and you know, each chapter in one setting, you can jump, you can jump back and forth. Um, so yeah, it it uh, it looks like a tome, um, and I do reference a bunch of different ideas that have come in there. Mm -hmm. um, the other happy accident was when the book showed up. I approved this cover, right? Like, I approved all this stuff. I didn't approve the spine, and when it shows up, I'm like, what's with the twelve font? on the spine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I never I never approved or disapproved that. Yeah. But but then on the flip side, it's also like it's just so simple. It's I was going to say it's so simple. It's you know? it's impactful. Yeah. You're like, "Oh, that's different." And then you read it because yeah. you want to know why it's so different. And this is this is us, right? Like yeah. it's, it's what I complimented you on your place. It's it's utilitarian. Mm. I'm not a showboat. Mm. I don't I don't like being the you know, I I've lived a life in the shadows. Yeah. So like to, to be the promoter and get out there and, you know, I got my cool little coat on, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> all these things are just, it's so weird to me. It's a so beautiful book. This is my one holdout where it's like, no, 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 this is me. Yeah. Just yeah. simple font on white. Uh, it's beautiful, know. man. It's a and, beautiful book. And and uh, I, I got to give them credit, the, the, the people with this. So we, the, the, the story that begins it is David killing Goliath. Yeah. And a lot of people know that story. Yeah. But there's there's pieces to the story that are way cooler than folks would recognize, mm. and and one of them is the five stones, 
One of them is the actual capability and capacity of slingers back then. Mm. You know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this in one of his books. That's right. But yeah. but but the accuracy and and the impact of one of those rounds is is like having a, a 380 pistol. Yeah. You know, so when you think of David and Goliath, we think of David as the underdog, mm. but Goliath was the underdog until David closed with closed the distance with him. Mm -hmm. And David refused to do that. Mm. And that is the same kind of idea that you and I were brought up in, mm. is wh why do we fight this way? Mm. We, we, we need to fight where we have the advantage over, over our enemy. Fighting to win. Fighting to win. Yeah. And, and, and that has translated into the counter-trafficking space and, and all these things that we do. Where, where did you, when you woke up and you're like, I have an idea for a book, where was the motivation coming from? So this started in Israel. So before I, before I took that move there, um, remember we had those rotations to, to work, work in Israel, mm -hmm. officers and a couple of Intel guys. Yeah. So I, I went there in 2009 and we, I'm sorry, <clears throat> sorry about that. We lived in Tel Aviv and I went to the Valle of Elah where David killed Goliath. Have, have you been to Israel? I haven't. And okay. it's, I want to go so bad. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, you're, you're a lousy Christian. I'm just going to, yeah. right no. <laughs> I, I say that tongue in cheek and yet yeah. I don't because, because here's what I, what I wish like in, in Islam to, to, to go to Mecca, to go to Medina, like th those are people recognize yeah. what the strength is for that tradition. Yeah. We don't encourage each other to do that, to, to do it. Like we, we, we should have like a, a, like, you know, you, you get a hat or you get a tattoo or you get whatever, you know yeah. what I mean? You, when you go to Israel, there, there, a Basil Pixner was a, a priest there or a monk. And he said, going to Israel is like having access to a fifth gospel. Wow. And it is. Wow. And, and I'd say even more, it's a fifth gospel. And then if you're looking, it's tying all of these things together from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, all the way into the New Covenant, what Jesus was doing to fulfill. It's just, um, I, I, I'd love to take you. I, I need, you know, so I, I was in Israel and I'm at the Valley of Elah, which you can, you can stand there within eyesight of where David killed Goliath because it's so well mapped out. The Bible says that the, that the, the Philistines were arrayed on the ridgeline between uh, Azeka and Sukkah, mm -hmm. and we they found those villages. You can go to the ruins of Sukkah, mm -hmm. or Azeka over here, and Sukkah over here. Wow. And then there's a, a ridge line, and there's a ridge line. So somewhere in this very defined space, wow. and then you can see the ravine where the where the river would have been. So you you can walk and you can pick up these stones wow. that David would have inspected. You know. Yeah. So I'm standing there, and the the uh, Israeli guide is telling me, he's like, okay, the Philistines were uh, right up here between, just like the Bible said, Azekah and Sukkah, so they're over here. Mm. The Israelites are on the other ridge between Azekah and Sukkah over here. Mm. And this is where all the, the battle happened. And I'm, I'm, I don't remember if I was thumbing through my Bible on the site or if I went back to the apartment, but I'm looking at the Bible and it's like, oh, wait a minute. It says, after David killed Goliath and cut his head off, the Israelites routed the Philistines and the Philistines retreated all the way back to their hometowns of Gath and Ekron. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at my, my finger here, mm. Gath and Ekron were over here. Mm. So the, the tour guide had it backwards. The Philistines were not on this ridge. They were on this ridge mm. because as a military man, in yeah. the history of warfare, nobody has ever retreated through enemy lines. And even, even when you set up your lines, you're, you're going to have your back to your hometown. Yeah. So all the Bible said was Azekah and Sukkah. So they, people just drew, they just drew the lines and they, and they're, it, as a soldier, I was like, no, 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 this isn't right. Yeah. And I got on the Google and the imagery in Google had it written that way. They had the Philistines on the wrong ridge and the, and the Israelites on the wrong ridge. Wow. Like even, even, so it became common knowledge that was inaccurate. Yeah. And that was the first thing that started me on this quest of, what else are we telling each other that isn't right? Is it specifically true? Yes. And and with the eyes of a soldier, the first, ver first version of this book was there's always more of the story, a soldier's perspective, because I started looking at these stories. Like, did it happen here? And if it did, why? You know, and, and you begin to understand that, that God has places on this planet that he keeps doing stuff. Yeah. And he does it over and over. Yeah. And you can see these patterns. And of course, you and I, survived 20 years of combat because we see patterns quickly. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we, we see trends quickly and we adapt to those. 
So it really started as a as a search on what are we telling each other that's slightly off, not not maliciously and not intentionally, yeah. but what it's you, you tell me and I tell someone, and then you know, twenty years later, a hundred years later, a thousand years later, <laughs> we're just repeating the same thing. Yeah. You know, um, and it takes one lieutenant colonel with a, a just a yeah, background yeah, check. Yeah, just in to, that, but yeah. but but it, it it started with tactically, but then it also began this search of tradition and myth. You know, because mm -hmm. as as American Christians. Protestants, evangelicals, we we give Christ, we give Catholicism. We kind of keep it over here. Mm. We, well, we, we're not Catholics. Yeah, but there is a couple thousand years of Catholic tradition and knowledge that we aren't accessing. Mm. And then Judaism, a couple more thousand years yeah. of tradition and and legend and stories mm. and this idea that Jesus Yeshua was Jewish mm. and what it meant to him. You know what I mean? He came to fulfill. So I, I, you know, it began this search of well, what what is Judaism? What does this say in Hebrew? What does this mean? What did he mean by this? So it it turned from a kind of a soldier's look to a to a faith look, mm -hmm. and then slowly but surely, I was I was starting to throw some of these military stories in, like oh, so this was betrayal, or this was fear, or this was whatever. This is this is the story that I experienced. Mm -hmm. So the military stories were never going to be there. Um, and then I, you know, I think I found a way to, to blend all of it. So there's a formula. You get the Bible story that most people know. These lost to time, incredible, beautiful highlights. We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll pick one with you. Um, and then, and then my story and, and what it means to me. And I'm hoping that people do the same. Yeah. What, 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 what can you relate to? Mm. And it, to me, it ended up being a crazy blend of the life of a combat soldier in Sof, very specifically Special Forces, Rangers, and Delta Force, and this and this biblical kind of base that I've I've always I was going to say I stood on it, but but I kneeled on it, dude, mm. and so did you. Yeah. How many times did you have to kneel down at your faith tradition to just make it through one more day? Yeah, you know. Well, what I've realized too, whether it was you know I I only did a couple rotations with the unit um, when I'm 88, I left the unit and and was a plank holder in the CIF co a new CIF company for Africa, C210. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, during Benghazi, um, well, the day at, the day that Benghazi happened, me and Tulane were back in the building um, in the unit doing crosstalks, and we were supposed to do a KLE with uh, the ambassador and the, the CT team um, in Benghazi. And then, obviously, that whole deal happened, and so... Uh, we got wrapped up into that and post all these experiences of realized there's like a divide of men who are more resilient because mostly I could attribute they had faith. Mm -hmm. And then there's another band of men that I've seen recently come out, um, which I'm very concerned about their mental health because they have no grounding in faith yeah. and they have nothing to hold on to, so they're kind of lost in the world. Yeah. They're reckless. They're toxic. They're they're killing themselves, right? And so, there. I don't know if you, it was your experience that there was a divide. I, I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I saw the divide, but I felt there was a divide between men of faith and and that line, and then men who talk more about Bahala and you know. Yeah, but how interesting. That they had to find something, right? They had to there, find something. There has to be Valhalla. There, yeah. there has to be something, right? Exactly. Like we don't, yeah. we don't just, you know, I, I, you know, I'm sure there's a few atheists in the building, you know, but I, th I think people would be surprised to know how many followers of Yeshua, yeah, are in the building, yeah, um, and then th those that don't, they have some other tradition, some other faith tradition that yeah. is that is these higher principles. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, people ask me about that with leadership and. It's just being a follower of, of Yeshua. It, it's just part of me, and I, I never I never wanted to slap you over the face with it. I just, yeah. I just wanted to, to live it. Yeah. You know, and it, and it's my one of my game one of my goals for this book here is look, man, b b be an atheist, but like believe in Valhalla. I I don't care. You're missing this incredible story. Even mm -hmm. even if you just think the Bible is a book, fine. It's an incredible book. And if you take the time to to really find the stories, mm. I believe God is the 
is the author of it, you know? And if you like, if you like Lewis or Tolkien or sci-fi or whatever, like, it, dude, you, you think J.R.R. Tolkien's a better writer than, than God, our <laughs> creator? You know what I mean? So again, even if you want to yeah. take God out of it, man, there's just, there's an incredible richness that really should excite people and ignite people to, to look at this ancient scripture. You know, I, I, uh, I think I say this in the book there, I don't know of another book where you talk to somebody and they say, uh, oh, I don't, I, I don't believe this stuff in the Bible. Oh, have you ever read it? No. Yeah, that's well, true. Yeah. Like, dude, you, you, that, that's like a movie. Hey, have you seen, uh, what did I just go see? Napoleon. Hey, did you see Napoleon? No, no, I don't, I don't like that movie. Well, did you go see it? No. <laughs> well, that, like, this is preposterous. You can't tell me you don't like a movie or a show or a book. Like if you, if you tell me you don't like the premise of it, if that's really what you're saying, yeah. but I don't think you are. It's another one of those things where we've, we're, we've accepted in our society where uh, I don't believe in the Bible, but you've never cracked it open. Yeah. If you don't believe in the premise of the Bible, then what's the premise? Mm. If the premise is ancient traditions and recommendations for living your life and building society, you you don't deny that premise. Yeah. You this know? is a historical chronicles and fixtures right. that existed. Right. I mean, we're not talking about a, a Tolkien book. This yeah. is like, this happened, <laughs> yeah. which is very interesting. I, I, you know, we talked a little bit before the podcast about um, some of the pieces of content that I did on the decline of men in our society. Yeah. And I think systemically, when people talk about drug overdose, suicide, all the symptomatic issues that are going on in the world, in, the, in our country specifically, a lot of it has to do with the loss of purpose in men. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of different things you could identify with men and why they've lost that purpose. But from your opinion, from your experience in raising boys, your background in the military and your kind of worldly experience, even dealing with uh, human trafficking or sex trafficking specifically, wh what has gone wrong? What, what has what has changed in our society? Yeah, I th I think it's it's what we were just talking about. We don't have something to stand on. Mm. You know, like it, dudes, stand on the Bible as 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 a guide for your life. I think a, a guy like Jordan Peterson. Have you ever met him? Mm. Oh man, I'd love to. I mean, yeah, why, why is that dude on fire? Because he's he's offering these these twelve principles yeah. to to guide your life, based in Christianity. Yeah, crazy. based based in Christianity. So, like like to strip away some of your preconceived notions about these Bible stories and dig into them. You know, skip the difficult stuff. You know, uh, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Skip skip those things. But man, read Genesis. Like the the origin of the universe and and the things that God put into play and the exodus of this chosen people, you know, and then and then the the, the chronicles and the kings and these stories, you know, um, the Psalms and the Proverbs as as like a prayer life and, and and a way to be inspired, and then and then in the gospel, like if 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 someone has never done it, just pick it up, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and and hear about this guy named Jesus, who I I call Yeshua, because that was his name. His name was Yeshua, and. If you're not enthralled by this dude, I, I don't know what to tell you. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the things, it's always interesting to go on podcasts because I don't know what we're going to talk about. And, then, and of course I have, there's 27 chapters, there's probably 40 little snippets in there. But when it comes to Yeshua himself, and again, even if you're looking at this guy as a literary character, mm -hmm. like take take some solace and some motivation. So for for 30 plus years, this guy lived his life quietly. Mm. So I believe, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop saying this. If you believe this is legend or myth, whatever, I don't care, but I, but I believe he was the son of God. And for 30 years, he just lived his life. And he became a carpenter, which is really a builder. We, 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 when we think of carpenter, we think of this nice table, right? Well, when you've been to Israel, there ain't a tree in Israel that could create this table. Like mm -hmm. there's just all gnarled ass, you know? So the, uh, uh, a carpenter was really a builder mm -hmm. and they were a stone stacker and they were a landscaper, you craftsman. know, he, he, craftsman. So like he, so for 30 years, Jesus just quietly built a life of integrity. Mm -hmm. And he knew what he was destined to do but he didn't, he didn't rush it. So there's a lesson for young men. Don't rush it, man. Go, go work. Go work with your hands. Learn a trade. Those of you that think you're going to go to Wall Street and, 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 and make a, a, a ton of money, you, you find me a guy who's happy that mm -hmm. has done that. 
go, go, go work, spend, spend the time. Quietly. Quietly. Yeah. You know, and then when your time comes, you're ready and be prepared. Uh, Yeshua's ministry was only a couple years. So that that's the other thing that, again, if, if, if people think about this, this guy had a public ministry for two or three years, and we're talking about him today. That shook the world shook in a couple years the without world. Instagram. Exactly. Couldn't hashtag it. Exactly. And I think <clears throat> when people think of the Bible, they and they think of all of the requirements, they think of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Jesus rarely said, thou shalt not. He's, he talked about this is what you should do, you know? And even when he talked about the commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two rules that we should live by. Mm. So don't, don't, don't get hung up on all of the law. G Jesus says he, he, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill every single, uh, cross every T and dot every I. Mm. But he did that through a life of integrity and grace and loyalty and mercy and confidence. And when I was young, the thing that blew me away was his bravery mm -hmm. in the final days. Mm. He went before these tri these tribunals and these trials and he was whipped and he was mocked and they put a crown of thorns on him and they hung him on a cross. So Mike, and I, and I, and I, I know people need to give me a second so they don't get upset at this. You and I could do that. Mm. You, you you can whip me. Mm -hmm. You can put a crown. You you can you can crucify me if it means I'm saving my family. Oh, I can take that. Mm -hmm. If it means I'm saving the world, oh, you better believe I can mm -hmm. take that. So as a as a as a child and into a young man, I was impressed by Jesus' bravery. Mm -hmm. But but now when I look at it, I I could do that. What I couldn't do is stay quiet mm -hmm. when people were accusing me of things. That I didn't say or didn't do. He had the power to to silence you. He had the power to snuff these guys out. And he stood there in humility and he took it and he took it and he took it all the way unto death. And that is moral courage. Mm. That's what we lack. We have too many guys trying to figure out if they have physical courage. Mm. And I'm telling you guys, most of you do, okay? burning building, run in to save the cat, run in to save the building, the baby. Most of you have that courage. It's just innate in men. It's there. I'm not saying don't test it. You should know. But it's the moral courage and it's that integrity that we've just con continued to let slip. Um, and we just talked about the hardships you went through with some maligning and people saying who you were and what you stood for. Mm. Dude, how painful was that? Mm. A little more painful than a 12 mile ruck or work out of the day, yeah. a work out of the day. Yeah. That, that moral courage is something that we have got to begin to pivot to. And a lot of times it's through physical courage. Don't get me wrong. A, a young man, we all had to do it. We all had to go on that journey. You had, you, it, it's that hero's journey, right? You need to know you're worthy. You need to know that you can stand up to your fears and to evil and, mm. and, and fight it physically. But there's a next level. Yeah. That's the easy button. I feel like. And, the, and it's preparation. Mm-hmm. And I, I am almost relieved at a guy in my 50s now where it's not about physical courage anymore. Mm. You know, I'm done with that. Yeah. I'm done with comparing myself to others. I'm done. Same. I'm done. You know, like, dude, Same. what do I have to prove? Yeah. How many selections have I gone through? <laughs> like, good God. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I've been tested and I've been found worthy of these units. Yeah. But now I'm being tested by my creator. And will I be found worthy? Will, it, will, will we finish strong? And I think as much as we're looking at these young men, I'm also looking at these old men who don't finish well mm. because we aspire and we aspire and we aspire and then we get everything we want, right? Mm. You're going to be a millionaire someday. Mm. You need to finish strong. All these things you're working towards, all these, you know, you wouldn't in a million years think of cheating on your, on your wife, mm. you know what I mean? Or doing some stupid shit. Mm -hmm. But then once you have it all, like David, mm -hmm. You begin to wander, mm. you know the Bathsheba syndrome. Mm. D D David, what was he doing? Not at war. His 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 soldiers were forward. They were at Amman, by the way. So the, the the battle that that his soldiers were at, they were in Amman. They were sieging the citadel of Amman, which I'm sure you've been to. Yeah. So that that's where they were. So David's back at Jerusalem, and his soldiers are fighting in Amman. What 
What's he doing back in Jerusalem? Now I got it. We all get tired, right? If he needed, if he needed some time off, if he'd had his life of war, I got it. But he was on the roof in the cool of the day, and he looks down and he sees a woman bathing. He should have turned away. Mm -hmm. He didn't. Mm. He lingered and he gazed. And at what point does he recognize that that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of his commanders, mm. one of his troop sergeants major? Mm. Uriah was one of his mighty men. So at what point does he recognize Bathsheba is Uriah's wife? Mm. Does he stop there? No. He calls her in to his, to his uh, palace, and then he has sex with her. Mm. So like, at what point could have, would have, should have, this guy turned away? So he has sex with her, he gets her pregnant, he finds out she's pregnant. Clever, clever guy, right? He brings Uriah back from the front and he wants, he, hey, you're doing great, blah, blah, blah. Hey, go go hang out with your wife. He wants, he wants to make it look like Uriah gets Bathsheba pregnant. Uriah's a super soldier. He will not go and sleep with his wife while his men are in combat. Mm. So he sleeps on the porch. David gets him drunk. Go home, sleep with your wife. Everything will be good. Uriah refuses. He goes back to the front line. Now David tells his commander, hey, in the heat of the battle, on the walls of Ammon, pull back and make sure Uriah gets killed. So here's one of those things, and I, I, I'm trying to find, because it's not in the Bible. In one of these traditions, it talks about David telling, uh, is it Joab or Abner? Joab or Abner to pull back across the river. So when you're when you're sieging, when you're laying siege to the to the citadel, pull back across the river and, and make sure your eye is exposed and dies. Do you remember a river at the uh, at, at the citadel of Amman? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's under the street. Mm. So it's, it's it, now we're back to this archaeology and this and this this pursuit. Or I'm I'm in Amman. I'm going. Well, it, 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 David told him pull back against the river. Where's the river? And a local Arab guy tells me, Oh, it's all under the street now. The, ri the, the rivers that that flowed in around here, it's 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 under the street. So we have, so e again, even that fact is is there. So now he has Uriah murdered to cover up this adulterous affair that he has. And then here's the thing that dawned on me, because I, 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 I you know it's a, it's a cool thing about writing; they iterate, right? So I'm editing, 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 and then it finally dawns on me also that's not the end of his dick move. He invites her into his home because now he looks like an honorable man, right? Oh, my best friend, one of my mighty warriors, one of my troop sergeant majors died in combat and his pregnant wife, who's clearly his baby, I'm going to bring her in and I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to raise that child like one of my own. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like all... All that's implied. I read that story a hundred times and it, and it finally, it dawned on me. He wasn't done. He had to be the good guy. He had to make it look like he was the good guy. He lacked the moral courage. Yes. Yeah. Until Nathan, the prophet, his good buddy comes to him and says, David. Come on, man. Yeah. That's what he says. And that's what we need. Yeah. You know, when kind of when, yeah, we need that. We need that accountability and all that is built through hardship. So again, it's a journey, right? When these kids that we're going to see in a couple of days, they've got to go through the physical fire. That's how you build these bonds. That's how you build this relationship where I'm able to call you up and go, Mike, what are you doing, man? Yeah. You got 999 sheep. What, what, why are you taking that guys? Yeah. You know, I, um, I want to get more into this, but, um, we have a time limitation on Mike Force Podcast. <laughs> We're going to actually segue and talk on the app side of Phil Krause and Rabo's app. And um, we're going to talk also about Jeff's level of preparedness and some things, whether it's ideology and how he prepares, but also how he implements that into his family life uh, on the back side of this conversation. Um, Jeff, thanks for coming on the podcast. How can people... Pick up this book. Is it available now? Everywhere it is. It's yeah. Free? It's on Amazon. Um, where have all the heroes gone? Dot com. I think there's one other guy with that book. So put my name or start with pilgrimage. There's a Kindle version. There's a this, this soft cover version you're looking here, and there's audio everywhere. I, I don't think the audio is on Amazon yet, but there's audio everywhere. It's this beautiful voice narrating <laughs> it. Um, it was very fun. 
Uh, so you can go straight to Amazon, where have all the heroes gone.com is, is the website where mm. you can see my leadership mm. course that's there as well and sign up for some stuff that I haven't quite closed the distance on. Uh, and then skullgames.io, you can find your, your your way to it as well. So. Yeah, we'll link all that stuff down below. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for making the time and uh, look forward to talking on the, the app side about all yeah. the levels of preparedness, man. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.